So um, I'd like to try and address uh, this question of um, remission. It's kind of a difficult uh, topic, so I'm going to address this from a couple of different angles. Uh, just quickly, uh, my disclosures, I've served on a couple of advisory boards, which really don't have any bearing on this presentation, uh, and I am currently supported by uh, the MGFA uh, as a clinician scientist uh, for a different project, which you'll hear a little bit about later in the talk. Um, so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the classification of myasthenia gravis just as a framework for this talk. Um, we're going to try and define remission in a couple of different ways, um, and I'll be interested to hear from the group um, as the talk goes on. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, in the context of remission, keeping score uh, and how that might be done. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the treatments in 2018 in the context of remission. I know you've heard a lot about um, treatments at this conference and in other settings. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about unanswered questions and possibly some future directions related to this um, topic. So just quickly, um, just to kind of get everybody in the same um, framework, we're, we're talking about myasthenia gravis today. Um, and uh, as you all know, it's an autoimmune disorder of the neuromuscular junction. Uh, it tends to... Uh, patients tend to experience some fluctuation in symptoms over the course of the day or over the course of a week or a month. Um, the condition tends to affect certain muscle groups more than it affects others, um, as, as many nervous system conditions do. Uh, in myasthenia, as you all well know, it tends to have a predilection for affecting the eyes and eyelids, um, shoulders, hip. Uh, occasionally uh, the diaphragm and other breathing muscles, as well as neck um, flexion and extens extension muscles. Um, I kind of have a picture there depicting that. Um, there's sort of a dual peak and onset. It's a bit more common in women um, prior to menopause, and then afterwards there's sort of a peak with men that's really sort of uh, equal among men and women uh, later in life. We classify myasthenia in multiple different ways, as I'm sure you've heard in other talks this week. Uh, one way we do that is by localization of where uh, the disease seems to be manifest clinically. We talk about patients who have ocular myasthenia gravis versus patients who have generalized myasthenia gravis. Um, ocular referring to patients where the disease really only affects the muscles of the eyes or eyelids generalized when it affects muscles and other parts of the body. Um, increasingly, we're, we're recognizing that there is a cohort of patients who have uh, what is considered to be refractory myasthenia gravis, which doesn't respond um, as well to some of the immunotherapies as other forms of the disorder. Um, in many patients, we talk about classifying them based on whether or not they have um, pathology in the thymus gland. Uh, we also talk about age of onset. Uh, another way that we, we also classify patients is by whether or not we're able to measure certain antibodies in the blood um, as part of the laboratory workup for the, uh, for the disorder. Um, and there's, there's a, a class break between patients who have acetylcholine receptor myasthenia gravis um, seronegative myasthenia gravis, and then we talk about this antibody called LRP4. Those three are sort of grouped together uh, because the condition tends to respond to treatment similarly among those three categories, and then we tend to separate, pa separate out patients who have uh, musk myasthenia gravis as that seems to respond to medications differently than the other three uh, categories. So in framing the context of a talk about remission, I think it's important to think about what, what the prognosis is of myasthenia gravis on a whole. Um, as many of you know, most patients with myasthenia gravis begin with weakness in the eyes or eyelids. Um, a large number of patients within the first two to three years of developing their first symptoms will develop generalized myasthenia gravis. Uh, 
Um, about 20%, uh, one in five uh, patients will experience either a crisis, meaning respiratory weakness requiring support, uh, or impending crisis, um, having a risk for developing um, respiratory dysfunction. And that tends to be more common in patients with musk myasthenia. On the right side of the slide, um, there, there are some very well done uh, epi epidemiological studies uh, in large cohorts of patients with myasthenia. And based on these studies, um, we tend to quote patients when they come to clinic that about 85 to 90 percent of our patients reflected in the orange box there will experience the greatest degree of weakness that they're likely to experience related to myasthenia within the first two years of developing symptoms. Um, and um, that's sort of depicted there on the slide showing that it's, it seems to be similar uh, between males and females over that first two years. You can see there is a small proportion of patients that will develop their greatest de degree of weakness um, farther out in the course of the illness, and that'll be important uh, when I talk about some of the future directions. The other thing that um, I think is worth mentioning is um, the continually declining rate of mortality from myasthenia gravis uh, depicted in this slide. As you can see, around 1900, it was a, it was a um, very serious, um, it still is a very serious condition, but it had a very high association with mortality. As we've learned more about the disorder and the ways to treat it, those black dots, which are reflecting the mortality rate, tend to come down. Uh, and as you can see, the mortality rate related to myasthenia gravis is now at um, less than 10%. Um, and that is despite the fact that we're identifying more and more patients uh, with myasthenia, which is reflected in the um, uh, open uh, triangles there on the graph. So I think it's important, um, and I'm sure many of you wonder about this, how, how do we define remission? And I think um, it's really important that we um, discuss it from a number of different angles. So um, when research trials are being conducted in, in myasthenia gravis, um, we tend to think in terms of some of the recommendations uh, from an expert panel that was convened by the MGFA uh, almost 20 years ago now. Um, and these are the definitions that have, have stuck um, when we're thinking about research patients with myasthenia. Um, and there's sort of three levels that we think about. So there are patients who have what's called complete stable remission. And in a research trial, that would refer to a patient who's had no symptoms uh, of myasthenia for at least a year and has not been on any treatment at all for myasthenia during that time. The second category that we talk about is pharmacologic remission, um, and that refers to patients who have no symptoms of myasthenia for a year, uh, but they continue to require treatment with some form of immuno, um, immune system active therapy um, to, to stay um, at that state where they're, they're asymptomatic from the standpoint of myasthenia gravis. And then in many clinical trials, um, we also talk about a category called minimal manifestations. Um, and that is a state where patients have um, no symptoms or functional limitations from myasthenia, but there is some weakness that can be detected um, by your doctor when you come to your clinic visit. Um, and patients who are in minimal manifestations um, are often treated with um, either an immune system agent or in some rare circumstances are on uh, peridostigmine, uh, also called mestinon, which is an acetylcholinesterase uh, inhibitor. So when we talk about clinical trials, we're often talking about these three stages as being uh, consistent with a um, favorable response uh, to treatment.
Um, a couple of years ago, um, and I'm sure that this has been talked about, I missed the meeting last year, but um, there was a, a panel of um, experts from around the world who came up with guidance for management of patients with myasthenia gravis, and they, um, after deliberation, came up with the following definition for, or the, the, the definition you see on a screen as a, as a positive outcome from myasthenia. So the goals of therapy, um, as defined by the task force, are to achieve one of those three um, states that I talked about in the previous slide, either minimal manifestations, pharmacologic remission, or complete stable remission, uh, with no more than very mild side effects from the treatment um, that is required to get to that stage. Um, and I think that from a clinician standpoint, that seems to be a reasonable definition of good care, um, but I think it needs to be qualified by the way that, that this um, uh, definition was derived. There were no patients on this international consensus guideline panel, um, so this is, this is really reflecting uh, a viewpoint of physicians, but not necessarily incorporating the viewpoint of patients and, and caregivers. So I think that um, warrants... Um, identification as we try and interpret these different definitions. The, the Japanese group has done a lot of research into uh, quality of life for um, patients with myasthenia gravis, and as some of you are aware, there is a short 15-item quality of life scale that was developed um, by my mentor, Ted Burns, through support by the MGFA, um, that uh, patients will often take either at home or at their clinic visits, and you'll see that in a second. Um, and when the Japanese groups were evaluating this as a tool in, in, in the patients um, in Japan, what they found was is that um, patients were rating themselves as having a, a good quality of life um, if they could achieve one of those three clinical states that I talked about, minimal manifestations, pharmacological remission, or complete stable remission in the orange box at the bottom, and if they were on less than five milligrams a day of prednisone uh, as a therapy. So in many of the trials um, coming out of Japan, uh, they are using that as a, a definition of achieving a good clinical outcome or, or sort of achieving um, uh, remission. They call it um, MM or better and less than five. Um, and um, this, unlike the previous two definitions, did have uh, patient input because they were looking at patients' quality of life in relation to the uh, doses of medication they were taking. So, but I think... Um, I like to put this quote up, and I've never met this neurologist, but I saw this on an um, email listserv that, I, that I'm part of. Um, and she writes, in neurology, we labor to preserve our patients' thinking, speech, and movement, the very essence of what it means to be human. Um, and I really think that that is sort of our goal, and that would be the goal of trying to achieve remission, is to really sort of try and return function uh, to our patients from, from the physician standpoint. Um, and, and Dr. Burns published a, a paper a couple of years ago in neurology, and he kind of defined the goals of care in neurology, um, keeping patients safe and alive, allowing patients to do what they want to do, limiting symptoms and adverse events, and that's something that I'm, I'm becoming increasingly interested in from a research standpoint. Um, minimizing disease effect on quality of life and giving people a better future. Um, and I think when we're thinking about remission, I think rather than having hard and fast um, definitions as we do in research, and it's important in research to have hard and fast definitions, I think the definition of remission from a clinical standpoint is more fluid, and I think it's important to think about some of these goals of care when trying to come up with a, a good definition of what it means to be um, in remission. And then uh, next click. And I think it's really important to, to try and understand how we are doing in achieving these uh, goals with patients. And this is a picture of my daughter on the, the right. And um, 
we're measuring lots of stuff in the state of Vermont right now. It's sugaring season. Um, as many of you know, the best maple syrup comes from our state. And my daughter's holding something called sugar on snow, which is unique to, I think, Vermont and other cold places like Quebec, uh, where you make kind of a caramel out of maple syrup, and then you roll it on snow, and then you can uh, eat it. So that's what's going on in, in, in my part of the world right now. Um, I'm going to talk about measurement, which is why I showed you that. And I'm going to talk about keeping score with trying to understand um, remission. So in, in, in research and in clinical care um, and thinking big picture, we often talk about treatment value um, and, um, or treatment success. And one way to measure that is to look at somebody's clinical benefit, how well are they doing on therapy, um, plus their quality of life uh, divided by the cost of therapy. Um, and that's often what you'll see talked about in the newspaper or in politics. People are talking about, well, how much benefit do you get and how much does this cost? And when they say cost, we're really talking about um, money. Uh, um, but when I think about cost, I really think cost sort of has three big components. There's the monetary component, which is obviously very important. Uh, but then there are two components that really deal with um, burden of treatment. Um, there are adverse events. So if you go on a medicine, do you get a side effect? And how much does that impact your um, overall life? Um, and then there's treatment burden, uh, which is not necessarily the same thing as, as side effects or adverse events. And treatment burden is really how, how difficult is it to, to sort of get the treatment that you're getting? Are you on an oral therapy, which you can take at home? Are you on an intravenous therapy that requires you to come to an uh, infusion center or come to your physician's office? Um, or is it uh, the kind of thing where you have nurses coming into your house to administer therapy? Um, how much does getting the therapy that, that you take impact your um, caregivers and family members? Um, and I think these are, these are important questions when trying to understand the, the cost of um, therapies. So um, an interest of mine is really in sort of measuring these things and understanding what is the clinical benefit of things and what is the, um, what is the cost or impact of, of the, the things that we're, we're doing to treat myasthenia and other conditions. Um, and I think it's really important to sort of keep score to understand are we, are we approaching a stage where patients are doing really well um, are they having good quality of life? Are they approaching a, some, some definition of remission? Um, and when we do this, it's important to sort of be measuring things. Um, and if you're going to incorporate measurements into a um, clinical visit, it needs to be relevant and important. It needs to have some meaning. It needs to be really easy to administer and to interpret. You can't have um, caregivers family members, patients, and doctors trying to do a maze each time you have a, a clinical visit. It needs to be really easy to do, easy to interpret, needs to be logical, um, and it needs to be easy to access. So fortunately um, for myasthenia, we have some tools that I think really um, achieve those goals. Um, and two of the ones that we use in our clinic and in many clinics um, are the quality of life 15, which is on the left side of the slide, um, and something called the MG composite on the right side of the slide. And the quality of life 15 on the left side of the slide is completely patient-derived and patient-reported. Um, and it talks about the impact of myasthenia on different aspects of your life. Um, and then on the right side of the slide, the MG composite is a combination of things that your doctor will observe about your physical exam when you're in clinic. How much double vision do you develop if we're asking you to hold your gaze in one direction or another? Um, how much eyelid droop do you get? How weak is it when you try and close your eyes? Um, and we, we look at certain other physical exam things like your neck strength and your shoulder strength and your hip strength. Uh, and we, we ask you about things like how difficult is it for you to talk at home? 
um, or how difficult is it for you to chew and swallow at home, or are you having shortness of breath when you're at home? And these are things that are really important for us because we can't see you um, when you're at home. And as you know, myasthenia is something that fluctuates. So the way that that um, you look when you're in one of our offices may be very different than um, how you feel on a typical Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and we need to ask you about these um, things. And the nice thing about these two metrics is that we can con we can keep score with these things. You can you can give patients a score. Some of you may have seen that there was an um, an app developed for um, different platforms like your iPhone or an iPad or um, other smartphone called the MyMG app, and that app has on it the Quality of Life 15 score. Um, and the reason why that's important to mention is that you can download it for free, um, and it allows you to keep score at home, which is important for us. It's important for us to know if in the three months since you know we saw you in clinic, um, are, is your score going up? Is, are, you, are you having less good quality of life? Or is your score coming down? Is your quality of life improving, suggesting that maybe we're approaching a really good clinical status um, for a patient? And there's a way for, for you to keep score and help us um, to, to help guide you make clinical decisions when you come into the clinic. And this is just an example. It's kind of a busy slide, but I'm just showing that in our clinic, um, and in many clinics, um, especially in relation to a, a new clinical trial that's opening, we're, we're keeping score regularly um, with different scales. And I have built into our electronic medical chart uh, ways to record um, our patient's scores on a regular basis. And this is a patient of mine um, who has significant difficulty with chewing and swallowing, some breathing weakness and limb weakness, and he's been on a lot of different um, therapies for myasthenia. And this is just showing one score, the MG composite score, which is that combination of clinical um, observation at the clinic and, and patient-reported items from home. Um, and you can see in the graph when when um, he came into clinic on the left of the graph at the top he had a score of 16 um, and he received IVIG as a therapy there and you can see that the line traced all the way down his score came down to a two suggesting that we did you know we were able to impact his um, myasthenia he had very little weakness at that point and then we dosed him again with IVIG and his score came down to a zero, showing that he was having no weakness at home and no weakness in the clinic. So maybe he was approaching one of those definitions of remission. Um, and then he was lost to follow up um, for a number of months um, and then came back in and his score was 17 again, suggesting that he had very severe weakness at that point. And then we had to treat him with a number of courses of IVIG. And you can see that the graph started to come back down and start to approach that zero. And one question I have is um, if he um, had had that MyMG app at home um, and had been recording his quality of life during that period of time when I um, – didn't have him at a clinic, if he, if he had been able to send me those scores and, and, and call in and tell me that, that, you know, things were not doing well, could we have intervened earlier uh, and kept his score lower and improved his overall function and quality of life? Because uh, I can tell you when he was at 16 and 17, he was pretty miserable. Um, and, and it was good for us to sort of get him on more aggressive um, therapy. And I wonder if we were getting regular information from patients at home, if we could intervene earlier. So again, just kind of returning to that equation of value or importance of, of different treatments or benefit from treatment. Um, and I just want to talk about adverse events as a, as a cost um, uh, for treatment at this point. Uh, in relation to the idea of achieving remission. Because when we talk about remission, it's really sort of, are you getting to a good clinical state, but at what cost? How much does it cost you to get to a point where you're not having very much weakness? I think that measuring adverse events is, is really important as a, you know, as a 
physician, I think it's important. As a patient, I think it's important. It's a question, certainly, uh, when I'm a patient myself or when I'm thinking about some of my family members, one of the things I'm always wondering about is, well, what is the cost of this therapy going to be for me or for my family member um, with regard to um, adverse events? And in 2018, we're really not very good at understanding that um, for um, the average treatment. Um, tools that we have available are sometimes medication-specific, so thinking about a specific drug like um, an ACE inhibitor, which is a blood pressure medicine, or thinking about a specific disease, um, thinking about patients' quality of life and hoping that if we're thinking about quality of life, that that really includes um, the, the burden of adverse events, and then also um, unweighted lists, so just kind of listing out adverse events. Um, and when um, we in medicine are doing um, and reporting out clinical trials or interpreting clinical trials, there's always th some version of this table that's on your screen right now, table four. Um, and, and in this case, this was the myasthenia trial of mycophenolet, which is Celsept versus placebo. And you kind of get this list, how many patients on the medicine, MMF, had different adverse events like headache and nausea and pain versus how many patients who had placebo had some of these adverse events. But it really doesn't take into account um, different gradations of the, the side effects that people may have had. Um, it's just kind of a list, and it doesn't really interpret it for you. It just kind of lists percentages um, and it really sort of leaves it up to the reader to um, try and interpret how important these things are and try and weigh them uh, in some way. And it's my opinion that we could do better um, because I often feel like, like this neurologist, I'm not a bow tie neurologist, but some of us are, um, with, um, you know, trying to measure these things. I feel like we get all caught up, and I, I really don't always know what to tell people when we're talking about their actual development of adverse events or trying to understand for them how serious adverse events might be. Um, so I've been working um, with the support of um, these organizations at the bottom to try and understand that, um, to inform this whole discussion about um, remission and patient outcomes, a unit um, that we've called the Adverse Event Unit, or the AEU, um, which is a physician and patient-derived unit that's going to try and measure uh, with a common currency, like a dollar, um, the burden of adverse events used to treat um, neurological disorders, and, in, and specifically myasthenia, uh, because as this unit is being developed, we have plans to use it as an experimental um, endpoint in the um, uh, comparative efficacy trial that I think um, was discussed earlier in this meeting, maybe two days ago, um, looking at um, sort of usual care for new patients with myasthenia. We're going to assign people adverse event uh, unit scores and see if that would impact uh, treatment decisions. And the way that um, we envision doing this is being able to develop sort of weighted scores of different side effect categories. Um, and if you're on a specific medicine like methotrexate, you come in and you say, "I've," you know, people will be asked, have you developed hypertension, high blood pressure? Have you developed diabetes? Have you developed um, what's called pulmonary fibrosis, and how bad is it? And we'll assign scores, and it'll be a weighted score based on how severe patients or potential patients view these different side effects and how physicians view them. And you can get a score at each visit. Next click. Um, and it allows us to sort of evaluate the burden over time. You could either give patients absolute scores at a clinical visit, or you can look at their average score over the course of a month. Um, and you could kind of graph it if you were looking at two different medicines. So in blue is mycophenolate, which is Celsept, and in red is azathioprine, which is Imuran. And you could kind of see what is the burden if we were measuring side effects with months on the bottom um, and the AEU score on the, the left on the y-axis. And you can see that the red line sort of goes up to 25 and is sort of staying up between 20 and 25. 
Um, the blue line really is hanging out closer to 10, and there's, there seems to be a difference in the adverse event burden of those two medicines. This is completely fictitious. This is not real data. Um, but you could see how you might compare two medicines based on their side effect profile. So this is a way where you could introduce into a conversation of how somebody is doing with myasthenia. You could talk about how are you doing from the standpoint of your strength, how are you doing from the standpoint of your quality of life, um, and how are you doing from the standpoint of adverse event burden. Um, and you could use those and put those things together to have a, a really, what I think could be a meaningful discussion of what you should do next with somebody's treatment. So now we're going to sort of transition a little bit into um, treatments in 2018 in the context of um, trying to achieve really good clinical outcomes uh, for patients. It's nice that this list keeps getting longer because there's more and more options for patients with um, myasthenia. Um, and I really like the concept of looking at the graph on the right side of the slide. So I've listed off some of the treatments that we have. So we have symptomatic therapy. We've got acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which is peridostigmine or mestinon. Um, and then we have immune-based therapies. We have steroids like prednisone. We have azathioprine or imuran. We have cyclosporin. We have mycophenolate, which is also called Celsept. We have tacrolimus, which is also called Prograph. We have rituximab, which is also called rituxan. We have eculizumab, which is called Solaris. Um, and then we have IVIG and plasma exchange. And there are different, different levels of data. So RCT means a randomized control trial. Um, and retrospective is looking at patient outcomes over time, and you can see it's sort of variable. Um, but I think that the graph on the right is sort of telling. So when you're thinking about different treatments for myasthenia, I think it's really helpful to think about when these therapies might um, have, have clinical impact and improve patients' strength. So um, ACHE inhibitors are the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, that's mestinon or peridostigmine, and that can work in hours, uh, but it also wears off within a few hours, as many of you know. Um, and then things that work on the order of days to weeks, we talk really about apheresis, which is plasma exchange. Uh, we talk about IVIG, and we talk about corticosteroids like prednisone. Um, and the reason why um, plasma exchange and IVIG are often used for patients who come into the hospital with severe weakness is because they, they seem to work very predictably, predictably within a couple of weeks. Um, there are, at the top of the slide, we have thymectomy, which may take years to really become uh, effective for a patient. Um, we have other immunosuppressants, and that really encompasses Celsept and Amiran and some of the other things um, that one might take by mouth, and those can take, you know, six months to over a year to really become effective for people. Um, and then there's the newer treatments on the block. We've got Ecolizumab, which is Solaris again, and we have Rituximab, which is Rituxan, um, which have some variable response rates, but it seems to be for ecolizumab or Solaris in the trial that was, I think, discussed at this meeting, um, that seemed to become effective for many patients after about a month. Um, rituximab is kind of variable with the data that's been um, presented for both acetylcholine myasthenia and musk myasthenia. It can, take up, it can take a month, it could take six months, it could take a couple of courses of that therapy to become effective. Um, and we're waiting on um, the results of a big clinical trial for rituximab in acetylcholine receptor myasthenia, um, which is being discussed at a meeting next week. Um, and then the results are embargoed until that time. So um, I just put up the results of, I'm going to put up the results of a couple of different clinical trials um, that I've been involved in to talk a little bit about um, remission and assessing response to therapy and kind of try and tie things back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of the talk. So this is a study that we did a number of years ago now um, with mycophenolate, Celsept, and 
acetylcholine receptor antibody myasthenia gravis at the um, University of Virginia and at Duke. Um, and what we did was um, we kind of looked back at our experience at these centers over time with patients that were treated with um, mycophenolate. And if you look at the left part of the slide, um, that's looking at whether patients achieved that status that we talked about at the beginning of the talk of minimal manifestation. So no symptoms at home, maybe a little weakness detected by your doctor at the office, um, and on some form of therapy. Um, and we looked at patients who were treated with um, um, Cellcept and, in many circumstances, prednisone, which are the open circles, and also patients who were treated with Cellcept on its own with no other immune-based therapy. Um, and on the left side of the slide, it's percentage of patients who are achieving that status of minimal manifestations. And you can see that it took, um, if you look at the bottom of the slide, just time, it took almost seven months, seven, to, seven months to a year before more than half of the patients had achieved that minimal manifestations status. Um, and it really took a year, and in some cases two years, uh, before we hit sort of an 80% of patients in minimal uh, manifestations status. So, and we were trying to use an endpoint that we thought reflected that concept of um, achieving a really good clinical um, outcome. And then on the right side of the slide, um, we looked at prednisone dose, and this gets at that quality of life idea um, that the Japanese were talking about. Um, we, in, in this study, which, which um, predated the Japanese data, we talked about prednisone less than 7.5 milligrams a day as really having a really good um, level of prednisone because we know that when patients get below that level, they tend to have a lot less side effects from that medicine. Um, and if you look to the very right of the slide, that's about two years, 25-plus months. Um, at that point... Uh, we had almost 90% um, of the patients or 80% of the patients were on less than 7.5 a day or off completely um, prednisone or 7 to 70%. Um, so they had, we had about 80% of people in minimal manifestations and about 70% of those folks were on less than 7.5 milligrams of prednisone per day. And we were thinking a lot about clinical status, and we were thinking about medication doses that may have impact on things like adverse events. What's missing from this study was quality of life data. Uh, what's missing from this study is sort of patient input into these outcomes, um, which the, the Japanese study gets at some. And the other thing that's really missing from this study is a measurement of the adverse event burden, which is where I think we could do better in keeping score in clinic and in clinical trials. So this is a project that we just um, published like a year ago, talking about rituximab um, and myasthenia. And we looked back at all the patients that have been reported in the literature with myasthenia um, with either acetylcholine receptor myasthenia or musk myasthenia who've been treated with um, rituximab, and we just sort of looked at what, what was in the literature and how were these patients doing. Um, and in the orange box, if you look at all patients with myasthenia, which is the first column, all MG, and in the orange box, we're looking at treatment effect. Again, talking about um, that minimal manifestations or the PR, which is pharmacologic remission or complete stable remission, um, about 40% of patients, if you took all patients with myasthenia, had a, uh, minimal manifestations or better. And in the line below that, 27% of patients were able to achieve that pharmacological remission or complete stable remission status. If you look to the third column over, musk myasthenia, musk MG, at the top and you look in the orange box, you can see that the rates are much higher for that cohort of patients for achieving minimal manifestations and pharmacological remission at 72% achieving minimal manifestations and almost half of patients achieving some form of either pharmacological or complete stable 
um, remission when treated with rituximab. But again, um, and this is this is we didn't design um, the studies that we're reporting here. We were just looking back at what's been reported in the literature. But again, we're sort of missing that patient input again. So we also um, just recently did a study looking at rituximab in musk myasthenia gravis at 12 centers around the country. And we looked back at all of our patients who were either treated with or not treated with um, rituximab. And we, again, sort of looked at it from the point of view of that um, achieving the idea of minimal manifestations, pharmacological remission, or complete stable remission. And if you look at the orange box at the bottom, the first column are patients that were treated with rituximab. The second column are patients who were not treated with rituximab. And in the patients who were treated with rituximab, um, about 40% of the patients that we treated achieved um, some form of either pharmacological remission or complete stable remission versus only 3% in patients that weren't treated with rituximab. And then if you added in the minimal manifestations category, um, it was like, um, so uh, it was about 65 or 70% of patients had one of those um, outcomes, which is similar to that previous slide I had up. Um, but we also looked at um, patients in a different way for this study, and um, we started to think about, and this was a retrospective study, meaning that we didn't, we weren't able to incorporate some of those measures that I talked about at the beginning. We, this was all looking back at patients' charts and how they did. But we tried to incorporate this idea of um, medication dose, which can be linked to adverse events. And we came up with a... Um, a uh, unique score for the first time called the myasthenia gravis treatment intensity score. And um, the colored graph at the top is really showing patients who got what we thought was a really good outcome. So we, we listed people as either a level one, uh, which is either minimal manifestations or better on low-dose um, immunotherapies, such as prednisone or mycophenolate, as a thioprine, methotrexate, and tacrolimus, and we talked about lower doses of those things, or a level zero um, were patients who were um, off of all um, immunotherapy and in complete stable remission, so totally asymptomatic on nothing. Um, and when we compared controls to the rituximab treated in the graph at the top of your slide, thinking about that clinical status, 40% um, of our patients were a level zero, so in complete stable remission when they were treated with rituximab versus zero in the control group. Um, and then another 12.5% of our patients had achieved that level one, the minimal manifestations and on low-dose immunotherapy. So like um, a little over 50% had achieved one of those um, two categories, which is really quite... Um, quite good. And, and based on this data, many of us are using rituximab as first-line therapy for patients with musk, um, trying to get uh, patients to one of these, what we think are very good clinical status. Um, so we're going to talk quickly about some unanswered questions and some future directions. So I think it, it's important to um, answer a few questions when we're thinking about remission. I think one of the first questions to answer is, does, does disease severity predict the likelihood of whether or not a patient will achieve remission. Um, and you've heard a bit about um, two clinical trials. The top clinical trial there is Ecolizumab or Solaris. Um, and then the bottom clinical trial is the Rituximab trial um, in myasthenia for acetylcholine receptor patients. And in these two trials, the patients that were selected in, in many circumstances for the um, rituximab trial, and by definition for the Solaris or Ecolizumab trial, um, patients were considered to be refractory, so not responding to the usual therapies. And I think a big question in these two trials is whether or not um, the patients in these trials achieved um, a remission state. And Unfortunately, at least for the ecolizumab trial to date, um, and that we may learn this data later, I think there's really a big question mark. 
so in the Echolizumab trial, what, we, what was looked at in the trial was sort of relative improvement on different scales, but they did not look at the number of patients who achieved what's called remission. Um, but there is still data that can be analyzed. I don't know if um, should Dr. Howard's in the audience or not. Uh, I know he's there. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to see from that data is to look at how many patients achieve remission, and we may find that it's a very high rate um, of patients, but I think it would help answer the question of whether or not disease severity predicts the likelihood of remission. And along the same lines, I think um, as we do additional trials going forward, looking at patients who have new diagnoses of myasthenia, which is the um, comparative efficacy clinical trial that's just gone underway, uh, we might be able to answer this from a different, different way by following patients forward and looking at um, how severe their, their um, myasthenia is at the beginning and the middle of that um, trial. So I think this is a, um, an area where we could um, learn a whole lot for you over the next um, uh, couple of years. Um, and then another, I think, very big and important question um, in clinical care of patients with myasthenia is, is there a point in time where it's appropriate to talk about decreasing or discontinuing um, immune system active medications? Um, and I think there's a number of reasons why um, one might consider this. So one reason is that Medicaid, this is really looking at that cost part of that equation I had up earlier. So one reason is to think a little bit about the expense of the medicines. So one study that was done at Duke looking at um, pharmacy expenditures. So the mean annual pharmacy cost for a patient with myasthenia in this one study was $9,000 per year, and that includes insurance coverage and co-pays. Um, and there's an estimated 40,000 patients in the United States, give or take, um, who have myasthenia that might be considered to be in one of those clinical states, minimal manifestations, or one of those two, either complete stable remission or pharmacological remission. Um, and if you added, if you multiply 9,000 by 40,000, you get almost $400 million. So there's a lot of money being spent, and maybe patients don't need to be on as much therapy. Um, the second reason is what is the long-term risk of being exposed to these medicines? And I'm sure that you've talked with your um, doctors about what it means to be on medicines that suppress or quiet the immune system. And we worry about things like infection or we worry about things like a long-term risk of some cancers um, as a side effect of these medications. Um, and I don't know that we know, um, we fully have been able to measure the bird th that burden um, for patients. Um, number three is how, what, are the, what is the adverse event burden in the short term for these medicines? And a fourth thing is what is the burden of therapy on um, patients, on their caregivers, on their family members? And then I think opposed to those four points is when thinking about discontinuing or decreasing immune-based medicines is, is it a safe strategy? Is there a high risk that patients will experience a serious relapse? We've tried to um, answer that. So um, we did a retrospective study a couple of years ago looking at um, patients who had their cell sept or mycophenolate tapered either um, in a scheduled way by their, uh, in, in discussions with their doctor or just on their own at home. Um, and what we found was in this particular study run at three centers, Duke University of Vermont, or four centers, Duke University of Vermont, Mayo Clinic, and the University of Virginia, that about 30% of patients had some form of relapse when they decreased or discontinued their um, cell sept. But three quarters of those patients were able to get back to a good clinical status if they went back up on their treatment. If they increased the dose of their treatment or they started it back up. Um, we found that the risk of developing a relapse was much lower if you delayed the decrease of medicine for three to five years. Uh, we also found that the risk of relapse was lower if the medicines were decreased um, more slowly, um, and the rate seemed to be about, for cell sept anyway, about 500 milligrams per year. Um, there was a similar study reported um, either the same year or the very next year, 
um, looking at patients who were treated with azathioprine or imuran, um, and there was a, a large number of patients in this particular study in India who had um, their um, azathioprine withdrawn, and in the orange box at the at the bottom, you can see that um, in this cohort there was about a 30% in the parentheses. Um, rate of um, relapse, and the study was done a little differently. It wasn't really being um, conducted to look at a, a dose reduction, so we don't actually know how many of those 30% um, got back to a, a good clinical status after relapsing. But that also leaves about 70% of patients who had their medicine withdrawn who didn't have a relapse. Um, there was also another study um, that was reported um, looking at mycophenolate again, and in this study, many of the patients stopped their myasthenia either um, in many circumstances on their own, but um, in some circumstances in discussions with their um, physicians. And when that was done, um, this group reported a 76% relapse rate, which is very different than the 30% um, reported in the first two groups. So I think there's sort of some unanswered um, burden here of whether or not um, decreasing or discontinuing medicines will, will result in relapse. So I think it's a really important question to um, pose. So um, we're actually doing that. Um, so we're designing a study right now um, to look at decreasing um, immunosuppressants in patients who have achieved what we think is some form of remission from myasthenia, pharmacological remission. Um, and we're, we're planning to do this in a randomized prospective trial at many centers, um, probably many of the centers that you go to for your care. Um, and we're looking at doing um, a scheduled medication dose reduction in patients who achieve what we think is remission. Um, and we're going to be looking at what are their clinical outcomes, so that composite score, the quality of life instrument, we want to be um, determining what is the impact on quality of life for patients if you do this. We're going to be looking at cost from a financial standpoint. Um, we're going to be looking at cost from the standpoint of adverse events, um, both using the unit that I've been developing, but also um, some other more standard uh, measurements of adverse events, and then something else that hasn't really been done in myasthenia, which I think is really important for any, any disease, is thinking about patient satisfaction with treatments, and there are ways to measure that in a clinical trial, and I think we're going we're gonna to try and get at that. Um, and the target patients for this um, trial are going to be patients who are in pharmacological remission for greater than one year on one um, medicine. Um, and unfortunately, because I'm not there in person, I actually wanted to pull the group. I had designed a survey that I was going to administer um, after this session today to deal with this um, trial because I'd like to get some patient input um, into this. Um, but this is a project that hopefully you're going to be um, hearing about soon um, in your clinics. So I think in conclusion, um, there, are, there are multiple ways that one might define remission. As we talked about, there are clinical trial ways to define it. There are um, practical ways to define it. Um, I think that outcome measures are important if you're trying to get at this concept of, of how patients are doing. Um, there are a lot of treatment options now for you in 2018, and it's really important to keep score to understand which are the most effective options, which are the options that come with the least amount of burden for patients. Um, I think that the rates of remission are unknown. Um, we tend to quote people that it's somewhere around 20%, as you can see from the trials that I, that I put up throughout this talk, but I think that we have not um, done a really good job at assessing that in many of the other trials we've done, so I think, I think that that um, remains an open question. Um, and I think it's important um, for many reasons to consider dose reductions in patients who have achieved a period of disease stability, um, and um, uh, we're looking to, to do that going forward.